Hey Reluctant Preppers, this is showing you just how easy it is to purchase silver without paying any premium over spot price. You just go to sdbullion.com rp, scroll down and enter the special code to get silver without any premium, and they'll mail it to your mailbox, discreetly packaged. Inside you'll find a beautiful 10 ounce bar of fine silver, and you are able to purchase that and have it and add it to your stack and your collection without paying any premium. And you're supporting reluctant preppers along the way. Thanks. As a responsible person with growing concerns for your privacy and personal liberty, you want to know where we're headed and what you can do about it. We ask the experts what you need to do to take prudent and responsible action to safeguard your family's wealth and well-being and what basic first steps will help you to be aware and prepared. ReluctantPreppers.com Welcome back, Reluctant Preppers. I'm really delighted to announce that we have Brad Harris, founder of Full Spectrum Survival, here with us once again on Reluctant Preppers. Brad has been a recurring visitor to our channel because he has such a broad understanding of many different areas of subject matter having to do with survival training, survival skills, preparations of many different types, and he has a deep network of other preparedness community people, as well as the monitoring of news feeds that he does to keep abreast of what the threats are that are out real and present in the world. Brad, thank you for joining us here again on Reluctant Preppers. Thank you, Don, again for having me and for everybody listening. We were hoping you could talk with us in the wake of these litany of major hurricanes that have been battering Florida and the south of the U.S., as well as the Caribbean. If you could talk to us a little bit about what hope we have as people who are preparedness-minded and trying to take care of our families of really doing meaningful preparations in the face of hurricanes and severe storms. Is there any way to really prepare for that kind of a risk? And what types of preps um, are are likely to withstand uh, severe situations like that? And what are ones that, well, they might help you in lots of other areas, but they just won't withstand you know that kind of disruption? Absolutely. So as everybody listening knows, Severe storm systems have been kind of on the radar of the entire uh, Western world for the last couple of months. They've just been kind of battering uh, at least the United States and surrounding areas over and over again, and with some severe storm systems in Asia recently as well. The first thing I want to say is there is a huge stigma right now against discussing this one trigger word, and that's climate change. That seems to be a trigger word for a lot of people in our community because they get behind the uh, the false representation that the climate is changing. But here's what I want to say to everybody is that it is not man-made. We are in a cyclical climate change. And so I have poured over hundreds, literally hundreds of white papers, scientific documents, and not just from... Uh, you know, Western-backed universities, I'm talking about for the entire world, and each one of them point to the same thing, that we are experiencing a change in our global climate. And as a result of that, we will continue to see worse and worse storm systems. So don't let the fact that we all don't believe that, you know, our diesel vehicle is causing the world to warm up stop you from preparing for the storm systems that are going to affect you and your family in the not too distant future. And that can, you know, wildfires are going to get worse. Tornadoes are going to get worse. Hurricanes, like you mentioned, uh, just a, a wide breadth of systems are going to begin to affect people more and more. And so it becomes that much more important that we each prepare for them. Now, you had mentioned what really stands up against a a severe storm system and what doesn't. And I think it all kind of falls back to the basic survival and preparedness goods. Uh, you almost have to take every possible scenario that's out there. And this can be from a severe storm system uh, up to a wildfire evacuation, all the way over to a pandemic, really anything that affects your local infrastructure for any undetermined period of time. And you have to boil that back and look at it through the eyes of an off-gridder, somebody who wants nothing to do with the grid. And so that involves propane resupply, uh, electrical, so no connection to the power company, uh, and inability to go to the store today or tomorrow to pick up new food. And look at it through those eyes of an off-grid reality and build your kit that can 
supply you and your family, no matter what happens that isn't so individualized like a like radiation fallout or like a pandemic. You can really build this base kit that will cover you for this large degree of things. And you can know that each item in there is going to be a benefit to you and your family. When we talk about a serious, I mean, there was when, when the power got wiped out in the island of Puerto Rico, there was talk about, is it going to be months? Is it going to be a year till they, till they get this recovered? This can be a significant duration uh, of a, of an event. So how can you go about developing, you know, people talk about, okay, I can have a couple of weeks of stuff stashed by, but how do you develop like a one year preparedness plan? Okay, one year plan is something that that we did for our family and for everybody that was in our group and that we had talked to a couple of years back. And the one year plan has everything in it that you and your family need on a day to day basis for an entire year. So it becomes about looking at your day to day life and how long does it take you and your family to go through a roll of toothpaste or the baking soda that you use if you do natural toothpaste? Uh, how long does some non-aluminum uh, deodorant, how long does it take you and your family to get through that? What about soap? Uh, you know, If you use dish soap, how long does it take you to go through that? And you really have to itemize and inventory all of your goods on a day-to-day basis and then use that, use like a two- to three-month platform and build that out for a year. And then you look and say, okay, well, I know I need X number of, uh, you know, the cheapest that I can buy, like an Ajax dishwashing soap. I know I need X number of that. I know I need X number of bottles of bleach, deodorant, uh, soap, normal over-the-counter medicine, things like that. And you build this plan out that has an individual tailoring to you and your family or you and your group and then you start to stock away at it. You start to chip away at what you need to get. And so it goes on your list every time you go to the store. And because it is a one-year plan, it's not something that unless you have a lot of money that you can just go out and do today. This becomes just a part of your normal preparedness planning. And you make a list that is always including of these items until, until you're filled up. And that list can also serve as your inventory. So if you need you know, 19 bottles of bleach, each time you go get one, you mark it off. Okay, I only need 18 bottles of bleach. And then you go back to the store the next time you're going just for your normal grocery or your normal goods purchases, and you get another item on there. And this allows you and your family to continue to stock up without having it be a big shock. And something that I'm running into a lot right now with some friends in the community is one person is much more driven to create a larger stockpile of goods to give themselves a better buffer than the other members of their family. And so they don't, they don't want to rock the boat, so to say. Uh, you know, no matter what you do, if, if you get a divorce, you're going to need a, not, a lot less. You're not going to need as much, but you're not going to be happy. So doing this little by little will allow you to create that stockpile without having your family member, whoever that might be, say, wow, 20 bottles of bleach inside of the cart today looks absolutely ridiculous. And it allows you to do this. And so what you're going to do with this one-year plan is you're going to have a full year's inventory of your day-to-day, everyday use items. So imagine on the very possible scale that a husband or a wife loses their job. This is happening all over the place right now or has a great reduction in income. Imagine them not having to worry about the next time that they have to go get toothpaste. Because I have some friends that have come to me and said, Brad, the one-year plan absolutely saved me from emotional distress. Because if you're really broke or if you're really destitute and you're making every, every fake dollar take as long and spend as much as you can with it, having to go get toothpaste or deodorant or Advil or any of these other things that are continuing to go up in price and are continuing to experience inflation with, the next time you have to go purchase it, if you only have $10 and five of that is going to a bottle of Advil, you're going to be hurting literally. And so people with this one-year plan are able to develop 
a, a buffer, a cushion, so that they don't have to worry about these everyday items. And at the same time, they're growing their normal food stockpiles and their other things that they go, that they go through on a day-to-day -day basis. And an additional benefit to the one-year plan is it gives them the ability to know exactly what they go through. And that's something that we all suffer from. You know, if you're not itemizing and inventorying each individual item that you use, you might think in retrospect that a five-gallon bucket of rice lasted you three months when, in fact, your family went through it in 30 days. You know, so it allows you to really become uh, intimate with your goods and with how much you and your family are using and does something that no store-bought survival kit, no uh, you know, lesson off of the Internet can do for you and unless you create a plan that is tailored just to you and your family. Right, so that's that's really the personalizing it and making it your own. That's it's also going to minimize the chance that you're going to end up with stuff that you're not going to use because you're getting the stuff you already do use on a recurring basis as well. That's right, and that and that's huge. You know, when when we've been affected by hurricanes in the past while we lived in Florida, when we've been affected as they moved up here uh, to our new location in Alabama, we didn't have any change in our day to day life. So while people around us were worrying about getting gas, they were worrying about filling up their propane, what they're going to eat that doesn't require the electrical grid. They had all of these real concerns that rushed upon them in a 24-hour period that left them frazzled and upset and mad at the power company, mad at the government, mad at the infrastructure. But for us, it was just another normal day, and you didn't have to change anything. You could eat the same food. You could go outside and do the same things. Uh, you know, you didn't have to think about what you were using that day. It was just an, another normal day. And I think for me, that's the most important thing of preparedness is it taking the shock away from the new normal that we will all experience when we, when we kind of step headfirst into a long duration emergency. And part of what you're talking about is, is learning to live simply and you made you voted with your feet. You you moved recently from urban Florida to rural Alabama, and have been working on a simple living homestead. Can you talk to us about first the philosophy and then the reality of that th theory about you know how much is enough and is less more? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. So we came from a county of nine hundred thousand people, and we knew the logistics. We knew it was horrible. If anything large happened. It was going to be an absolute nightmare to not only continue with life on a day-to-day -day basis, but also to evacuate your family once everyone else kind of caught word of what was going on. So we were constantly on edge to be the first to make a move if we had to. And we decided, and we, had, my wife and I had thought about this for a great deal of time, and we decided, like you said, to move with our feet from 900,000 people up to just... 9,000 people. And so we moved from the Tampa Bay area of Florida all the way over to a county in Alabama at the foothills of the Appalachian Trail that really backs up right up to the trail. And we are able to kind of have another cushion should anything happen. Um, as far as minimalizing goes, that is a huge part of our preparedness plan. We look at everything and we moved here to a tiny home. Uh, on just two acres, and we're, we're in the process right now of taking it completely off the grid and having a budding homestead that provides as much of our food as possible, definitely 100% of our sustenance, but, you know, we're not going to have a chocolate tree or enough coffee bushes to, to kind of provide that 100%, but we're going to be able to provide 100% of our sustenance, our survival needs, and also remove ourselves from the dependencies of the world that much more. And as we did that, we moved from a home of 900 square feet with a family of four into a 12 by 32 tiny home with two lofts that comes in at 300 feet, square feet and change. And so as we did that, we saw that we were going to have to make some changes to our own lifestyle and to our own needs. And we had a plan in place. And that plan was to look at every single item that we had and say, first, could I get away with this item, but less of it? 
or a smaller one of the same item, like an example is a television. And then second, if we didn't use that item within the last three to six months and it wasn't a part of our preparedness plan, we got rid of it. And so we donated and sold and got rid of probably 60% of just the, the goods that we had that we had no monthly or even quarterly use of. And I'll, I'll give you a, a good example is just the last week, we took a 60-inch uh, television, 4K television, that frankly looked ridiculous in our tiny home. I mean, <laughs> yeah, 12 by 32, it looks like you're in a movie theater, and that's not what I'm going for with, uh, you know, with a rural off-grid lifestyle. And so we took that and bartered that with a friend for some other goods that we needed. And so we started using and developing this system of minimizing, but at the same time, not just wasting and not just getting rid of something. Always make sure that it provides you and your family with a use. So we've thought about that quite a bit, and we watched, you know, there's tiny, tiny home living show on HGTV or whatever, and that seems in some sense to fly in the face of the idea of preparedness of amassing a large stockpile of anything. I mean, if you look at how much toilet paper and paper towels and Kleenex and, and everything, you, and you talked about the one-year plan, I mean... My 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 imagination runs to the fact that if I think if I added all that stuff, we would, we would chalk fill a tiny home. There'd be no place in there for us. So how do you reconcile the need for stockpiling supplies with a small, minimal life, you know, living situation? Have an additional place to put them. And so we have a storage unit um, that we put them in that's on site on our property, but it's not a living space. So if we were to, you know, if, if something happened and we had family come up, that we could make it a living space immediately. But as it stands today, it's just a storage unit. And that's the way that we have kind of sat in between that so that our house could still be minimalistic and still be a tiny home and then have the storage space that would be, like you said, for our one-year plan. And, you know, when you talk about the, the larger things, like you had mentioned toilet paper, we kind of got away from that. And so we started familiarizing ourselves with what the rest of the non first worlders do. And can, you know, can you get away with, can you mentally handle wiping, you know, wiping yourself after going to the bathroom with something that isn't just disposable? You know, could you, could you deal with a reusable uh, system of cleaning yourself? And so we developed a system that worked for us and it kind of worked a little bit. We, we walked into that system because my wife uh, cloth diapered our children. And so it, that kind of took away the stigma that we have of don't touch, you know, don't touch your own bodily fluids or anybody else's. And once we kind of got over that stigma and found a good plan of action and a good method that worked for us that retained hygiene and also let us uh, you know, kind of go about our normal day-to-day -day life, we found that you needed a lot less space. And that's just toilet paper in particular. And we kind of did that with the rest of our preparedness uh, items. And we said, okay, well, if we, if we can do away with a great amount of space that this takes, what else do we have? You know, do we need uh, a 50-gallon drum of oil? Well, that's a lot better than having a whole bunch of small can one gallon canisters of, of cooking oil. And so we just took that bulk, but minimalized outlook to it to retain our own one year plan to retain our own preparedness planning. One of the challenges we've run into is like freshness dating on things. And half the time, well, okay, there, I'm going to run out with too many halves because I'm going to add up more than two things. But uh, part of the time, uh, we haven't been attentive enough to really monitoring and clearly easily labeling things because you have to search and search every time you go to your pantry to figure out what's the oldest or whatever it just seems too burdensome when you're in a hurry so uh, that's one thing is just inattentiveness and letting things expire another problem we've had is actually purchasing things that we really don't want to use on an ordinary basis we think well it just would be the kind of thing to be good to have if you really had an emergency but then we don't use it and then it expires and then the third problem we're having is just questioning, really? How can that possibly be expired? Like, 
for example, isopropyl alcohol. You can buy 92% isopropyl alcohol at the pharmacy, and it has like a one and a half year expiration date. It's like, really? What's going to go bad about alcohol? So that just can you talk to us a little bit about people who are concerned about not wanting to waste money by, because you got my attention when you talked about a, a large container, for example, of oil, I would be concerned about freshness and that kind of thing with a bulk, large bulk package rather than small packages. But how do you deal in general with the topic of expiration dates and what, what tricks have you considered? One of the first things that I want to say is that as long as you're boiling it, the rest of the world kind of just brings things up to temperature where it kills all that bacteria. And there's only a couple of bacteria that cannot be killed by boiling. Um, oil in particular, if you let it go rancid, that can happen. And you don't, you definitely don't want to cook with it after that point. It doesn't mean it's useless. You can use it for, uh, for fuel. You can fuel, use it for yeah. lanterns, things like that. Yep. Mm-hmm. But you wouldn't want to cook with it, but you can take the measures to not let it go rancid, um, just like you would with anything else. But there is a risk there because if you have 10 or, you know, if you have 50 one gallon oil containers, the risk of them all going rancid isn't as high as one 50 gallon container. So it definitely takes some attentiveness to detail with that. Uh, second, I want to say is that the the Western world is making changes to expiration dates. This is ongoing right now where they're trying to take away the expiration date and, and make it a best by date. And so a lot of items, like you said, won't have an expiration date anymore. Alcohol definitely won't. Uh, a lot of canned foods, they're going to push the expiration date out to a decade and then you'll have a best by date, you know, within a, a reasonable period of time. And so that will take that concern away from a lot of people because we've kind of been driven to this wasteful thinking of if it expires, it's less risky and it's better just to get rid of it. But in reality, there was really no danger of continuing to use that item. Um, like, a perf- you know, you look at MREs that people eat from 60 years ago. Sure, that's way past the expiration date, but they're absolutely fine. Same way with old canned foods and things like that. So if you become a little bit more uh, concerned and if you start to think about a little bit more of what can actually go wrong with it and you look for those dangers, is, is this a swollen and bulging can? If it is, I don't care if it doesn't expire for three years, I'm not going to eat it. <laughs> That's right. You know, and you look for those dangers and otherwise you say, okay, well, this is some SpaghettiOs that, you know, my kids adore. And yes, it's three years past the expiration date, but I'm bringing it up to a boil. There was nothing wrong with the can. Everything looks and smells great, you know, and you kind of just make those changes in your life. And if you could talk to us briefly about when we're talking about severe storms and surviving those kind of scenarios what about communication in a in a grid down or cell phone down scenario you talked about you know needing to be able to resupply propane or whatever but how do you even reach out to the the people you first of all your your immediate family and loved ones but then also maybe a circle beyond that so that's that's definitely a tough one and it takes some forethought and it needs to be individualized to that person or to that group so if your group consists of uh, you know, 10 different families or even just 10 different people, but you all live in different counties or even different states, your communications plan needs to be developed just for that. So you need to sit down and say, okay, what if we have a, a week-long lapse in communication? Well, if not everybody is ready on a ham radio and you're not, you know, if the rest of the grid is still up, you don't want to go into the potential fallout of breaking uh legal protocol to make communication there if it's not essential. So if you set up a trigger system between your group and a a long time communications plan, you can kind of marry these two together. So the trigger system will say, if this happens, you move. So if communication can be made between group A and group B, that's fine. You can talk it out. But if not, if this event happens, if this trigger takes place, you go to this step no matter what. And so if you have a family or if you have a group and they can't be in communication together, but one of them is experienced mandatory evacuations or can't get, uh, you know, can't get over a bridge or state lines are closed or there's been a larger event, something radiation wise, 
then that's the trigger and they move to the next part of that plan no matter what. And so you don't need communication for that. And along with your trigger system, you have it in part of your communications plan that you mark yourself along the way. So if you get to zone one, you mark something along the way. This will be especially helpful if someone doesn't make it to their destination. So as a, as an example, everyone can kind of take to heart. If you have a loved one, whether that's a husband or wife or a family member, or a child, and you are both supposed to make it up to the next state north of you. And you're both most likely going to be taking the same interstate up. And it's in your communications plan and in your trigger system that you would mark a certain uh, street sign or a certain exit location. And you would have an individualized marking system. Might be a can of spray paint and a certain symbol. <laughs> it could be anything. Then if one person doesn't make it to the destination, the rest of the group, if they find it necessary, can step and walk backwards and find where they last made it to. So there isn't this large unknown of what do I do? I'm sitting here. I can't call my wife. She's supposed to be here. And you would have no idea at what point she made it to or even if she ever left. This uh, system needs to be, as you point out, to be meaningful and useful, needs to be fairly detailed and needs to be planned out with everyone's knowledge in advance so that everybody's playing off the same playbook. That's right. Yeah. And that's where really the the well-detailed communications plan comes into play. Because even if everybody has the best case scenario, and let's say that everyone does have the best case scenario, you all have... Uh, a well-powered off-grid ham radio system. You're, everyone's licensed up. Everyone stays together. That's really the best thing that can happen because at that point, as long as the atmosphere is not changing or there isn't an active jamming or active communications disruption event going on, you'll be able to come into contact. But the reality, as I've seen it, is that that's a very small percentage of our community just because of the man hours that it takes to get everyone on board with that sort of plan. And so instead, there is a large reliance on cell phones, uh, internet connection, and those are really the two. And then you get localized communications like GMRS and small radio systems, even if they're higher powered. But those are really the two mainstays of cell phone and email. So as soon as those go down, you have to have something else in order so that people can know what to do for that next step. If people want to dig in further to that particular topic, is there a particular website or channel uh, that you recommend that, they, that they'll find uh, good resources, depth of resources in? For ham radios, I, I, I like Gorilla Comms and Survival Comms, uh, Comms Prepper on YouTube. They have a lot of information. It's very technical for the most part, so it really is something that, that you're going to – uh, want to dive real deep into it. But if somebody has a question, I have no problem helping out, you know, just email me at full spectrum survival at gmail.com. And you can say, Hey, I have this idea. What do you think about it? And I'll just give you my opinion. Cause that's all we're really, you know, we all learn together. And so I just want to help people where, where I have gathered information before. If we could turn our attention to a phenomenon that seems to be happening with increasing rate of change in our society. This has been, I've started to see more and more articles about this. I've encountered it in my professional life. And it seems like something like akin to the uh, industrial revolution that, that blindsided and, and disrupted so many people's lives uh, a century ago, but it seems to be coming so much faster, like within the next decade for sure, perhaps even half a decade. And it just reminds me of nothing more than like a, a train that's about to hit us, regardless of what anybody might say about financial collapse, or regardless of what anybody might say about pandemics or about weather events. If you just put all that aside for the moment and just look at the loss of employment, the the, the revolution of the loss of of work and you could there's aspects you can talk about the rise of the machine artificial intelligence people have said oh well these are these are uh, these industries are offshore proof because this reason that reason and then sure enough nope you can just you can just onshore near shore bring on workers and, and completely replace the workers there but even in like in manufacturing 
entire industries are retooling their factories and replacing production workers with robotics and so on, and now with artificial intelligence such as the IBM Newton uh, AI, that sort of thing, and and Google searches and all that. It's like, what's the purpose of a travel agent anymore? What's the purpose of a, even a uh, lawyer to do legal research for you? What's the purpose of a doctor to, to diagnose your thing, your illness or whatever? More and more, it seems that there's just going to be this wholesale slashing of opportunities. We already have the lowest labor participation rate in the last 40 years, we're told. But if another 50% or more of jobs get eliminated in the next five to 10 years, in the face of that, people have said, well, that's not so bad because people don't really need to work. Uh, I believe it was Mark Zuckerberg said, why don't we just provide universal basic income for everybody? And rather than thinking that humans have to work, why don't they just do other more creative, productive things and they just get, get money from the government? You've been doing some research into universal basic income. What do you see as the, as the most probable real effects of that on a society, on the individuals, on families, etc.? 